Welcome to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm Kieran O'Connor. I've got three co-hosts today, not just one. John, we are joined today by Monica Guzman and April Lawson, who I could have referred to as guests, but I think I'm just going to refer to as co-hosts because we are expanding the roster here at the Brave Rangels podcast. Mm -hmm. So welcome, guys. It's good to have you with us. That's right. Ladies, please. Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Ladies, good to be good to be joined by you both. Let it not be said, though, for anybody who's listening, that uh, one, uh, that April Lawson has not been at the heart of the vision, even on the sort of media and messaging side, but just for the organization in general for a long time. And that Monica has not been not just a friend, but a best friend of mm -hmm. Braver Angels uh, for a good long time as well. Many of you will have read some of her, read uh, one of her recent essays on Braver Angels Media, may have heard her uh, participate in one of our recent debates. It is a fabulous honor uh, for me and for all of us to bring Monica onto the Braver Angels Media crew officially. So let's get that little announcement out of the way and just say that it is awesome uh, to have the, uh, the, have the, the Fab Four here in attendance. Uh, for this uh, for this special episode, so and for those I, of you not watching I, on video, by the way, um, there are some jazz hands and there is some dancing, so don't you know don't miss out. Know what you're missing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, okay. Well, we are um, we are here to talk about um, I guess the thing that is I was going to use the word plaguing totally inadvertent. Oh. I guess the thing that. <laughs> Forgive me. No, don't do that. <laughs> the thing that is, the problem that is, uh, uh, you know, um, perturbing uh, the country, perturbing is not a great word either, but the problem that is uh, on everybody's minds, let's put it that way. COVID-19, <laughs> the pandemic, but also um, associated with that, our broader sort of response as a nation to how to, how to deal with this problem, specifically the question of how do we go about, how do we look at opening society up, opening the economy up again? Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that's fraught with division. There is a left-right sort of general divide in this country over how we ought to open up and just over how serious the problem is. And before we get into sort of general uh, uh, discussion about how we bring Americans together in this context, I think it's important for those of us on this um, um, on, on this uh, podcast right now to maybe talk a little bit about our personal experiences here because I know we all we all have them. Um, so let's go around a little bit because folks listening, I think, are going to relate to where we're all coming from in one way or another. Um, Kieran, what has your experience been like uh, so far? You know, in just in just a couple of minutes uh, during lockdown and um, under COVID nineteen. Yeah, I mean, I'd say all things considered, I don't really have any unique complaints. Uh, most of the challenges I'm facing in the grand scheme of things are pretty manageable. Uh, I've been living alone, which has been challenging. Um, I know a lot of people who've gotten sick. Uh, a good friend of mine's father passed away, which was very tragic. Uh, so I think living in New York City, the the pandemic has definitely been up close and personal, but I'm you know, lucky to have my health, the health of my family, a job, a place to live. And in some ways, I think it's lent some additional perspective about what's really important in life, the fragility of life, and how we can come together in times of adversity, uh, or how we can be driven further apart, which I think is the nature of the discussion today. So, I think that I've been simultaneously um, saddened and outraged by a lot of the things I've seen in the news, particularly when it comes to our government. But I've also been heartened by the way people have shown up for one another, stood up for one another and supported one another. And so I think that it's tricky to disentangle those two things. And I'm excited to be here with you all to tackle that question. But overall, I'm good, taking it day by day. 
And, and Karen, just very quickly, uh, you're speaking to us from uh, from New York. You live in New York City. I, I, that's the sort of the hardest hit part, I think, of the entire country in terms Definitely. of, I think, infection rate. And although New Jersey, the world, the worst right. city in the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, although I think New Jersey is struggling similarly. As a New Yorker, uh, do you have a particular sort of um, experience here or take on how the city has been dealing? It's an interesting question. I was in Manhattan on 9-11, um, which was obviously a devastating blow for the city. And I think now we're, you know, the latest projections I saw say that some people expect we'll be having 3,000 people dying a day. So that's essentially a 9-11 every day. So the scale of the tragedy is pretty incomprehensible. Um, but I think, you know, people who live in New York especially if they make it past a year, they're generally pretty gritty, hardy folk. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, it's, it's sad in one way because part of what makes New York so special, it's density, it's openness to the world, uh, are part of the reason that it's been so hard hit. And I moved back here in January and so, there's part of me that's like, oh man, I wish I was still in California with a car. I could just go drive up to the beach in Malibu. But there's another part of me that feels like it's right to be here with my city, um, with my friends. And I don't know. There's also a part of me that fears that New York is a preview for the rest of the country. So I hope that's not what happens. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Thank you for that, Kieran. Um, Monica, what is your um, what has your experience been like? Tell us. Yeah, so I'm in Seattle, and uh, as we all know, the you know the state with the first infection, uh, the metropolitan area with the first U.S. death from COVID. Um, so we have been quarantined a while, mm -hmm. and um, I'm very proud of, very happy with, generally how the leadership in the state has performed, at least relative to other places. Um, and just judging by the outcomes, despite the fact that we had some of the earliest outbreaks, um, our results are actually, again, relatively good. Uh, but of course, you always want to hedge all of that because it's just such an uncertain time. Um, and to, you know, to, to just describe my life right now, I've got two kids. I've got a seven and a five-year-old. And so there's homeschooling duties to do. And let me tell you, I am extraordinarily appreciative of teachers right now. I, I, I had a fraction of understanding <laughs> of, of the service they provide. Now, now that it's been on me and my husband, we, we're both lucky enough to be, you know, able to work from home, which is a privilege that a lot of people cannot access. And it's, man, I think a lot about how we're seeing we're, things that used to be invisible right? Differences in the ways we lived are becoming so stark uh, because the economy is kind of like splitting us up in these, these directions. So, you know, I think about the world and I, and I think about the, the local area. I think about myself and there's sort of these different spheres I travel up and down. Um, my neighborhood, it's amazing. I've actually moved into this house just two and a half months ago, basically right before COVID struck. And, uh, we have gotten to know our neighbors, I think, at like a 10x rate than we hmm. would have gotten to know them if it hmm. hadn't been for COVID. And that may seem counterintuitive, but it just turns out that my street in this neighborhood is kind of like a good walking avenue. So now that everyone is walking and it's more than just, I'm just going to go for a quick walk. It's like, this is my experience with the world for the day, <laughs> my daily walk. And so you see people walking and everybody says hi. Ah everybody mm. says hi you know mm. because we're hungry uh for that mm. so also seattle has been blessed with uncharacteristically incredible weather so we have one thing going for us um mm. and so it's in fact beautifully sunny outside and there's a part of me if, if you live in seattle long enough you're conditioned to say the sun is out go outside <laughs> uh, so there's a whole like ah! <laughs> think about being indoors right now. Yeah, um, yeah, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll I'll say again just how it, there, there's this there's this thing in my head happening that is both very grateful for the fact that I'm pretty much okay and that my family is pretty much okay, and then there's this mix of empathy, compassion, guilt, 
for how many people are not okay, right? Yeah. And, and what to do and what to think and how to position myself in that. Um, I've, you know, I've, I've been donating. I, I did a volunteer opportunity. Um, like I did a volunteer project helping out a, a, another neighborhood in Seattle that, that is far less sort of economically well off than my own. And it meant a lot to me to do that because I, I knew that there was an impact. But there's this crazy thing going on where helping other people in a lot of the ways that help the most, like showing up for them is actually bad. Mm. Like being close to them is bad. Mm. And that is just, I just want to take that fact and squeeze it and kill it because it's just, <laughs> I mean, really, you know? Okay, so that's a quick tour. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that. And I share your frustration being sort of a, what would you call a tactile sort of <laughs> personality myself uh yeah the moment in which we need to show each other we want to show each other the most in the way of affection the most in the way of presence we are literally prohibited from being able uh to be that way so more on that in a second um i want to go to april for anybody who's um, watching us uh, on on youtube right now you will notice that april is a bit relaxed um head back on a pillow it is not because she is lazy, trust me, uh, or, <laughs> or because that is her normal podcast <laughs> uh, posture, but um, April has had her, um, her own experience um, during this time, and I'm, I'm going to let her uh, uh, talk about it and tell it. Um, April, would you share, share with us a little bit? Totally. Well, so um, like most people, I was like, this is really scary, and you know, maybe I could get it eventually. I guess a lot of people are going to get it eventually, but you know, I'm in my early thirties, like, eh, I'm mostly staying inside. I'm sure it'll be fine. Mm. Nope. <laughs> Turns out, nope. <laughs> I am, um, my boyfriend and I took what seemed like a very safe trip in, just in our car. We drove to Pittsburgh from Washington, DC, where we live, um, to visit his two new baby nieces, um, who have both been born in the last like three months. Um, and his sister is a nurse who's going to have to go back to work. And so we wanted to see them before that happened because it seemed like the risk was just going to go up. And anyway, it seemed like it would be fine. Um, but yeah, I have just been reminded that when people say this thing is really contagious, it's really contagious. And so I assume that what must have happened is that somebody brought something home from the hospital. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, so that was three and a half weeks ago. And I'm on, this is my third week of, of um, having the virus. And I have to tell you, I, um, yeah, I'm not sure I've ever been this sick. So I'm, it's, it's great, right? This is week three, which means I'm on the uptrend. Yeah. Um, week one was not very fun. Week two was much worse. Um, and then, because this, the virus, as you, as a lot of folks probably know, comes in uh, two waves often. So you go through one week and then it seems like you're getting better and then you crash again. And that's actually where it's most risky. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, last week was really pretty bad. And, uh, but I'm, like I said, this is week three. And so I'm very, very grateful to be here. Um, <laughs> in terms of people ask me what I've had in terms of symptoms and like, this is a, a weird bug. Um, and I really think that we don't understand it very well yet. And it's mutating, right? So like it's, um, I've had all the usual stuff, uh, cough, shortness of breath, um, fever, headache, chills, da da da. But I've also had like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, uh, dizziness, uh, congestion, like just everything you can think of basically. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is like, I have to tell you, I'm not sure I've ever been this sick. I might've said that, but like it just really, what that meant to me was that, well, like I said, I'm in my early thirties and like, I have never thought seriously about my own mortality before, not in a, not in this way, not in a like, oh, this could all end um, before I feel like I've really done what I wanted to in the world, before I had a family, before I like, uh, I don't know, lived the life that I wanted to. And I just think that, um, yeah, it has changed me uh, in that way. And so Kieran, your point about the fragility of life is, really um really like sunk in for me and has really been driven home in a way that in a concrete way that it has not been before so that's been um pretty intense and then you know there's also the stuff about 
literally not being able to leave, right? Like there's, so I'm not going for walks because my doctor's like, you better not leave that apartment. <laughs> and, um, and to be honest, I, walking around the block, like is exhausting to me right now. Like it takes me four hours to recover from that, um, of sleeping. And so there's that. Um, but, but, you know, I am overall really blessed and really lucky. I have a really wonderful boyfriend who's taking good care of me. I have supportive friends. My parents are wonderful. I like my coworkers have sent me all these nice get well messages. Um, I have my, my tea mug and my soup mug, um, both right here. And uh, yeah, I just, boy, I have to say this is, um, yeah, it has definitely opened my eyes to the, what it means to be really sick and, uh, and also just how, so how vulnerable you become and also how blessed you are when you recover. And um, the, it has m meant that I, so as, as you heard, I did a little bit of travel, right? Like, and I always felt guilty driving under those signs on the highway that say, stay safe, only essential travel. I was like, this is kind of essential, I think. Um, <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, this is a mean thing. And it's not actually surprising to me after having it that it's, that it's killing people. Um, and so I, uh, that said, Monica, I'm also really attuned to how people are suffering. And I, you know, I understand that it sounds heartless to say, let's open up the economy, even though 3000 people will die a day, right? That sounds inconceivable. But the problem is that like, um, boy, it is hard to overstate how much people get hurt when the economy doesn't work. And I'm not talking about the rich people, right? I'm talking about the majority of people and so I can stay home right and I still have a job but that would not if, if this had happened to me and I had many kinds of jobs I'd be out of work in addition yep. to stuck on my back and I would be um worried about where is my next paycheck going to come from how am I going to eat like and so it's just and and those things do add up to death and stress and the other thing I've been thinking a lot about is quarantine is, um, I have a real heart for women's issues and um, domestic violence is up. Most crimes are down, which is good in DC anyway, but there are, the things that make families hard are very much exacerbated right now. And so, yeah, that's a lot. On the whole, this is real serious. I have been taught that in a real personal way. Um, but there's a lot of pain to go around and it's still hard to know what the right answer is. Yeah. Can I, right. can I say right. to, to your point real quick? Like I, I read, uh, I read a, a local news article in Michigan, uh, the site of a lot of protests to, to speed mm -hmm. up the opening of the economy. And one quote from a, a protester that really stood out to me. Um, it was a, you know, just an adult man with children and parents. And he said, it feels like I'm being asked to choose between my mother and my child. Which one mm. do I want to save? Because mm. if it's about health, it's more to save my mother. But right. if it's about my family's economic well-being and the tough choices I have to, to, to make, it's about what kind of life I can provide for my kid. And mm. that just, that like got me right in the heart. I thought, wow, those kinds of choices. There, there seems mm. to be a divide between the folks who don't have to make those choices and the folks who do. Right. And, yeah, and right. I kind of want to hear more, much more from the folks who do. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of what makes this so uh, holistically complicated. Um, I'll say a little bit about my own experience and it's not particularly dramatic, um, but I'm here in Los Angeles. Uh, California is doing quite a bit better than many other places. Uh, in terms of, I think, infection rate, uh, death count, et cetera. Part of that is because it's a big state, even in Los Angeles, which is a, obviously the biggest city in the world, but things tend to be much more spread out, although they're very dense areas. Um, there's also some speculation that the virus may have visited this state um, earlier than it did elsewhere. And so there may be a certain degree to which it has already perhaps uh, already perhaps penetrated the population and, you know, that may account for its current uh, trajectory. Uh, I was already working from home when I wasn't traveling. So my previously aggressive travel schedule has been cut off. But otherwise, I'm here sitting in the same chair in front of the same bookcase that many of you <laughs> will be used to seeing me 
by to begin with. Um, me and my wife, we were already homeschooling our, uh, our three uh, little kids. So the big difference there is that I'm just in the way more than I was uh, previously. But uh, we're, we're fortunate in as much as our day-to-day -day experience has not been, um, has not been uh, disrupted as much as other folks have been. Uh, I've been touched by this more just through my kind of um, empathy with the folks uh, around me in my life who are being uh, touched by it and by just watching the country broadly speaking. My concern for you know you, Karen, being in New York, uh, particularly at moments in which things seem to be very scary um, in, that, in that city, um, I know that this doesn't just apply to me, but all of Braver Angels, I think, has uh, been touched and actively concerned with yourself, April, um, just because there's such a there's such a closeness there within our team, and so we've all dwelled and on your situation and thought about you and prayed for you, and I won't embarrass you, but you know, it's um, people have been real kind, right? Real kind, and it's it's made a difference, yeah. Right, right, exactly. Um, and so in all of these ways, I have been uh, impacted. I've also been impacted particularly uh, by, my, uh, by my father and seeing him deal with this larger sort of situation. So a little bit about my dad. My dad may very well have had COVID-19 uh, uh, before there was great awareness of it. Uh, a few months ago, he wound up going to the emergency room in the middle of the night, because after thinking that he had caught a flu, he wound up experiencing violent lung pains. And uh, he uh, said shortly after that he had never felt so close to death, and yet the doctors couldn't tell him what exactly it was. And so it remained an issue for a matter of a few days, and ultimately he got over it. I guess we'll never, we'll never know. It's possible that he's been through this already, but his current struggle is in the fact that he's not allowed to he can't go outside. For every day, just about every single day for the last 20 years or so, my father has gone and walked up in the hills of uh, Will Rogers State Park in Santa Monica, which has a series of beautiful trails. It is sort of the centerpiece activity of his life. And I worry about him now from day to day because he seems to be languishing in a sort of, sort of depression. Mm -hmm. You know, he's starting to kind of hate where he lives and he's he's depressed and morose looking at the country broadly speaking wondering if america is ever going to be the same again wondering if he's ever going to be able to get out his door and enjoy the life that he once knew um and again you know at the age of 70 he might otherwise be high risk but he is he's not enjoying life you know at the moment um and so it brings brings us around i think monica to the point that you were making about the about the sort of sacrifices that people are making across a wide spectrum of circumstances uh, in this in this situation, and I think we do have this sort of crystallized conflict of concerns, very legitimate concerns, uh, between folks who, on the one hand, seek to protect American life uh, by perhaps uh, uh, aggressively uh, supporting uh, uh, various policies. And folks, on the other hand, who I think are looking to protect an American way of life, if you will, by seeking to maybe accelerate the loosening of some of these restrictions for economic reasons, uh, for reasons of, of, of liberty and wanting to sort of, I guess, push back against the transformation of American life that some may fear can never be undone. Uh, in all of this, I see a great deal of humanity. I see a great deal to sympathize with. And yet, I think that we are at risk again, and understandably so perhaps, but I think we're at risk again of demonizing one another as Americans uh, for concerns that we should be able to muster some real empathy for. Um, so uh, Kieran, why don't you, uh, do you want to speak to that real quick and then we can, we can circle around and, and see what folks make of the conversation writ large here. Yeah, I think uh, Monica articulated it well when she talked about this choice that a lot of people are expressing, they feel they're being forced to make between their economic be well-being and their, their health. Uh, and that is true personally for communities and, and for the nation, obviously. And it's a real choice and it's one that we need to wrestle with. But one concern I have, as with so many issues in 
the current climate is it's just becoming so binary. It's like either, you know, we protect public health or we reopen the economy. And folks who are concerned about public health, you know, are just limousine liberals sitting at home who don't care about struggling mothers. And, you know, the folks out there who are really concerned about the economy are really just callous people, you know, for whom death is but a statistic. <laughs> um, and I think that's very dangerous. And I think it just shows so many of the problems that America has today. Um, because if you look at other countries, you know, countries like Germany, they've showed that you don't necessarily need to face the choice in as stark terms. I would argue, you know, Germany took a science first approach. They had a very strict lockdown, which was, you know, well observed by the population. And they were able to flatten the curve and limit cases tremendously. If you look at the top of their curve, you know, it's so much lower than where we are. And now they're starting to open up. They're actually starting to open up restaurants and they've been able to keep cases low. Um, but it seems that in the United States, for so many reasons, what I fear is that because of the binary and the polarization, we might end up actually getting the worst of both worlds, where mm -hmm. we sort of rush to, to open up because we're impatient and there's polarization. And frankly, it seems to me the message from the administration is sort of one of just like throwing their hands up and saying, well, you know, we tried and, you know, maybe we just have to live with 3,000 people dying a day. Um, and my concern is that if a lot of states move too quickly, especially states that aren't really even yet seeing a decline in cases, you're not gonna see much economic growth because people are gonna be afraid, uh, understandably so, to engage in commerce. And you might actually end up prolonging the economic pain uh, unnecessarily. And so I, it, it's, it's hard not to be discouraged for me, just speaking as a blue, um, when you look at the way the administration has handled this, um, because I just think there was so much opportunity to harness the spirit of the United States mm -hmm. and what makes us exceptional. And instead, what's exceptional about us is how much we've failed each other. And mm -hmm. I hope that we can use it as a, a lesson, but it's just the president in particular just seems to view all of this in very nearsighted political terms at which he is the center. Uh, and so you start to have this effect that you see in totalitarian regimes where people around the leader are afraid to give him bad news. Um, and I don't know, I could go on and on, but for me, it's been discouraging. And I think what we really need to do in addition to empathy is to try to keep some nuance in our mind because it's so easy for us to put people in boxes and that's what then drives the binary and, and i think the binary is what ultimately drives a lot of this bad policy making because this crisis has shown how crucial policy making is to keeping people alive and the tens of thousands of people americans that are going to die unnecessarily because of choices that a relatively small number of people in the government made because they were weighing other interests uh, is just incredibly dispiriting. Mm. So Can I many jump people, in there? Course, will, um, yeah, Monica, it, it, if, if I may, just very quickly, I was just going to say that many people, of course, will defend uh, the administration's performance, including many of our members, uh, on the grounds of the fact that in certain areas he took actions that were initially criticized but later accepted as having been as having been pragmatic and largely sound the ban on uh, the ban on travel from China being one instance and folks will make the argument of course that President Trump is he's in a difficult position in as much as it's difficult for him to do anything that isn't cast in a negative light by an adversarial media and uh, at the same time, of course, this points to the larger fact that we have to continue to pursue on each side of this issue an actual presidential election in the context of 2020 uh, against the backdrop of a crisis that we would like to muster earnest unity and genuine empathy 
across the sort of you know communal spectrum in the United States, while still creating space for us to argue fiercely over which side's policy uh, or which side's you know sort of governing approach is going to help us deal with the crisis in the moment, uh, deal with our problems and concerns in the future, while not hopefully getting so stuck in the finger pointing that we forget how to sort of raise up the spirit of America in your terms, Kieran, uh, that you feel that the president is, has failed to muster and that others will accuse his critics of having, having discouraged. Uh, so it's difficult. Monica, I imagine that that, um, that might tie in a little bit to, to your thoughts here. Um, but what are you saying, Monica? Yeah. Um, I mean, one thing that I am trying to do more of, um, and I've been a journalist for a long time, and it's good practice in journalism, and, and I think some of some of those like the the nice principles of that craft kind of a, a apply uh, to when you're trying as Kieran put it to hold nuance right to have nuance and uh, a good question I ask myself is what am I missing what am I not seeing because each of us only has one life right we only experience a narrow channel of things so you know one thing one thing that is interesting to notice right is that the four of us we are bi-coastal, but we are all in densely packed cities. Um, and so what is often, and I mean, I shouldn't even say often, is like overwhelmingly missing from the stories that Americans tend to hear and, and that tend to be broadcast, you know, most powerfully mm. is the perspective of folks who do not live in cities. Right. And so that, when I think of what's missing, I think a lot about that. Um, now, going back to the 2016 election, the 2012 election, really any presidential election, uh, I, I remember how uh, journalists would like make the point in stories about red and blue states. And this happened in particular in 2016. They would make the point when showing the map and which state is red and blue. They would say, by the way, it's probably better for all of us to look at counties not states because if you look at counties you know you may have a blue state but it's mostly because of that one city right um and so that becomes a more nuanced way right more granular literally from state to county it's a more granular way and i think if you if you reason yourself through that and you say well nuance is good then maybe that's a better way to think about it right and so then i then i think about the fact that you know, other than President Trump, there are all of our governors. My husband and I joked the other day that for a lot of people, this is probably the first time they've even noticed their governor at work um, and really noticed the work their governor was doing. <laughs> but governors in many states have to have to wrestle with the tension between cities and counties. But cities have the overwhelming communication advantage. And I mean overwhelming um, with public opinion and all that. So here's how that comes back to me, to the question at hand about about reopening the economy, which is that the stories about how economic well-being is health are, are largely stories about rural America. And maybe, maybe that's just too strong of a statement, but I mean, economic well-being is health for everybody, but it is particularly stark in rural communities uh, because of the, of the economic inequality that is only getting worse in our country. So. So for someone in a city who is used to Zoom calls, you know, who, um, who kind of, I don't know, maybe comes from, I mean, at least has enough financial well-being to be able to live in a city because cost of living is basically the entry point to living in a city at all, right? It's harder to feel intimate and familiar with, um, with that choice of either or. But I'm reading right now a book called Tightrope uh, by Nick Kristoff of the New York Times um, and Cheryl Wudun. And it's, it's talking a lot about the deaths of despair um, that are all over the country. Um, deaths, you know, from is it alcohol or diabetes or all kinds of kind of rampant health issues that our society tends to consider vices, drug addiction, right? That it's the person's fault and the person's problem. But actually, <laughs> you tell the story and you unwrap that, a lot of it is about economic well being, a lot of it is about whether people feel they have control over their own lives and autonomy and they are supported by their society. So all of which is to say, I have a huge, I am trying to look at an enormous blind spot in my lived experience, mm -hmm. which, is, mm -hmm. which is that blind spot, right? Yeah. And for what it's worth, and I'm not here to defend or attack really anybody, but for what it's worth, whether coincidentally or, in, or intentionally, something about Trump right now 
is I think really pushing back against the assumption that is, you know, a fairly well-founded one, that we should always just listen to the medical experts and that they need to be the primary and the only voices in the room. And I think that's actually a conversation, right? And many, many liberals would say, maybe that's not a conversation, but what if it is? What if, what if medical professionals and those voices in the room are good for one phase, and then you really got to bring in people who understand the range of experiences and how economic well-being and autonomy and emotional well-being tie into health and, and, and the quality of life and how quality of life ties into life, right? Because there's a binary we think of with life. You're either alive or dead. What else is there to say? It's like, actually, <laughs> there's more to say. <laughs> there's more to say than that. So talk about nuance, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot there. Um, so I, I, I will, you know, I guess to, to close, to close that long uh, line of thinking, there's, there's an opportunity for America, you know, and you can, there's a lot to criticize in our leadership, but there's an opportunity here. America has always been a grouping of extraordinarily different experiences, and we have not been very good at listening to them equally, mm. right? And mm. so we are being faced with this challenge of, guess what? It is even harder to ignore what you're not listening to, right? Right? And things are going to get real bad, <laughs> if real bad and worse and worse and worse. You know, to Kieran's point about, oh my God, like we have this opportunity and we're maybe we're failing each other. Yeah, we are. We are. You know, but there's an opportunity here to ask more about what we're missing and go and chase those things deliberately instead of thinking we already know all we need to know. Right. Monica, I wish we had time to pick up everything that you put on the table and over uh, over the following uh, podcast episodes, I think we will. The subject of expertise, for one, is a really remarkable one. And the fact that rural America is going to be experiencing this in a way that's different from urban America um, is, um, is, is another. But pivoting back uh, in our final moments here to not just COVID-19 and the lockdown, but the fact that we have to manage a political process uh, at the same time, um, I want to circle around to you here, April, um, as designer, of course, of our Braver Angels Debates uh, program. Uh, I know that you're a person who has thought a lot more than most, most of us, I think, about the importance of empathy on the one hand, but on the other hand, the necessity for us to really be able to challenge one another um, in stark and passionate terms in the context of a political society right? That we need to be able to ultimately sort of hold mm -hmm. these two dynamics, which are very much in tension, nevertheless, uh, together simultaneously in a way that can make society work. And so in this particular context, COVID-19, uh, Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, the election to end all elections, I shouldn't say that, but you know, <laughs> no, no, do not say that. <laughs> oh, just, just to say, just to say that in this, you know, <laughs> in this crazy moment that we're all living through, how do we do both of these things at the same time? How do we do politics right um, and do empathy mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, <clears throat> so um, the first thing to say is I actually don't think those two things are very much in tension. Mm -hmm. And that's going to sound crazy to a lot of people because boy. Um, so I run the, the Braver Angels debate program, and I cannot tell you how many times people have said, okay, but can we just not call it a debate? Can mm -hmm. we call it like a conversation? By the way, it's always blues. Anyway, can we call it like a, a sharing session? <laughs> no, it's a debate, guys. And like, that's because the conflict is welcome and intentional. And like, and, you know, I think we all here would agree that like, the reason, one of the reasons that uh, debate and um, is so important and that the that America is so strong is that we actually um, Monica you just said something beautiful about how America has always been a collection of very different experiences and each of those right has a piece of the truth it's like the the blind man and the elephant right so you think you know does the elephant feel like a long thin thing which uh, which is the trunk or a flat thing which is the side or a, mm. right a tail and mm. I the the beauty of democracy is that like we get to try to hash that out. Um, and, and it doesn't happen through like, <laughs> what happens in America right now, I feel, is that um, because our, our intellectual and democratic culture is pretty weak and our sort of community life is pretty weak, what happens is, so again, suppose we're talking about an elephant, people in their private thoughts are like, clearly elephants are 
flat creatures <laughs> that are smooth. And then they go on, they like read the news and they see all these people saying that elephants are like long thin creatures. And they're like, those people are out of their minds. And then they go on Facebook and Twitter and they're like, obviously guys, this is ridiculous. <laughs> like da, 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 Right. And then they just make people mad. And, and social media has this because it doesn't activate the this is another human being on the other side uh, part of our brain mm -hmm. it's um easy for that to become inflamed but really <laughs> um we need people to come together in a debate and and the weird thing right about braver angels debates and and this is why they are um there we uh, see them as a collective search for truth not as a um an attempt to win uh is that people build empathy through arguing with each other which sounds nuts, but if you argue with each other in this way, i.e. not attempting to beat the other side, but to say like, look guys, this is what I think is true, um, then people hear that, they hear that, and they get heard, which enables them to hear other people in a, in a totally different way. And so I think, Monica, I love your point about rural America. Um, I have a, I'm from Kansas and have a real heart for that. And I just, the extent of, uh, oh, I don't know, disdain that gets showered in rural America is hard to overstate and not to mention just like absolute indifference and ignoring. Um, and so I really appreciate that. And I think that the, cause um, this is a hard problem, right? Like this is exactly the kind of the uh, thing that democracy is in its best form can handle better, better than any other kind of society because it's two real goods that are intention, right? It's physical health, especially for some people and economic health, which is uh, more universal and especially acute for certain people. And of course those come together in all sorts of ways, but the, the trick will be to take this conversation, which is rapidly, as was probably predictable, being projected onto the political campaign and make it a productive one where people actually say, I think elephants look like this. And other people say, well, I, my experience is just not that. I think it's this other thing. And pretty soon, um, if we can do it right, which is a big if and something that we are trying our very hardest to contribute to to the positive outcome right there um if we can do it right um america can do this really well indeed yes so that is the work of braver angels and i and i think all of us would like to say thank you for everybody listening to this podcast who is a member who has supported our work who has participated in our programs or helped to spread the message on social media uh, if you are enjoying this podcast, please uh, like, share, uh, subscribe to it. Uh, if you are listening and you are not a member, go ahead and join us. Be a part of this. Paperangels.org. Check out our upcoming uh, debates, our upcoming events. Uh, we've got things happening every week, every other week. Uh, and we're only going to be getting more active as we move through 2020. Uh, this is tough work, folks. You know, everybody you've heard from on this podcast has a different point of view and a different background, but we are Americans at the end of, at the, end of the day. And that means that I think we owe each other some basic empathy, some basic kindness, and I think the courage uh, to be willing to stand in the gap for one another, to understand each other and to support each other when things get rough, right? So look, we can do it. You can do it. And by the way, we can have fun uh, while doing it. <laughs> Uh, jazz hands. Jazz jazz hands. Jazz hands. You gotta watch the YouTube. You can, you can be part yeah, of the jazz for, for everyone thing. who can't see, I'm jumping up and down and spinning around. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. That's right. So get involved with us, Braver Angels. We are building a house united, and you'll hear from us next week. <laughs>